Our reading this morning is from the book of Daniel, chapter 3. We're going to read the whole chapter. So if you need to take a seat, feel free to do so. But if you can remain standing for God's word, that would also be good. Daniel 3, verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, whose height was 60 cubits, and its breadth, breadth six cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to the King Nebuchadnezzar, O King, live forever. You, O King, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O King, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, But I see four men, unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. 
Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire. And the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and has delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree. Any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, and their houses laid in ruins. For there is no other god who is able to rescue in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. This ends the reading of God's word. You can be seated. And let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we just read an incredible story in your, in your word. Uh, the true story of, of your servant standing for you, uh, even when it cost them seemingly their very lives. And we read a story, Lord, of your great deliverance. And Lord, all these things, they stir our hearts in so many ways. We just pray that, that we would have a profitable time now as, as you help me to preach your word. Help me, Lord, to declare this text of Scripture in all of its glory. And we pray, Lord, that we, each one of us, would hear your word, would be encouraged, Lord, by your, by your gospel, by who you are. Lord, help us to see more of you today. Would you bless this time? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I remember when I first heard a sermon on Daniel 3. It was actually a short little sermon between songs at a Shane and Shane concert. I was a fairly new believer at the time. And I remember how the choice to obey God rather than man was described for us. And really to stand for God, you know, trusting in Him to save you, but being willing to stand even if He doesn't, even if He lets you die, choosing to serve God even if it costs you your life. It was a really powerful message. But at the time, it seemed really hypothetical. It seemed kind of far off. There was no Gestapo at my door. There was no fiery furnace being heated up for me. The worst persecution I had faced at that point in my Christian life was light ridicule and some shaming. Okay, nothing too serious. I had to really stretch my imagination to picture myself in these shoes of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Really to picture uh, that I'd be making such a consequential choice to obey God rather than man, and that the stakes would ever really be that high. Well, it's not so hypothetical anymore, is it? That was about 15 years ago. As the years have gone on, the hostility towards the Christian faith especially here in Canada, especially in the West, it has, that hostility has grown to levels that I wouldn't have imagined back then. It has grown to levels that, we, that really make this story make more sense. And we can picture being in this situation. In recent years, we've seen Christians fired from their jobs, pastors arrested, churches seized, charges laid, businesses ruined, threats made, and for all manner of reasons, really. But the common cause has been the same that, that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego faced. The same cause that we see in our text today, that the faithful wouldn't bow. The faithful wouldn't bow to an idol. The faithful wouldn't bow to the current thing, whatever the current thing is. They chose to stand with Christ. And, and here we look at this and we see an example for us as believers of how we can stand for the Lord. This is an incredible story that I, I believe even all of our kids here probably know this well. But as, as we go to it, we'll see, I, my prayer is that we'll see wonderful things in this passage that are going to encourage your heart, give you steel in your spine, help you to stand for the Lord, and be encouraged by the presence of the Lord. Well, this chapter, 
deals with the three friends of Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, to give them their Hebrew names. These men had just been promoted to manage the affairs of Babylon, of the province of Babylon. We don't know exactly where Daniel is in this text. You know, maybe he's, for whatever reason, he seems to be away. Okay, he's been promoted as well, but he's not with these three in this uh, story. And these events seem to fall on these three alone. This chapter comes right after Nebuchadnezzar's dream. You remember from last week, the dream in which he saw a great statue of a man, right? A man made of gold, with golden head, with silver, with bronze, with iron and clay. There was the, in that dream, there was not only the statue, but there was this mysterious stone that struck the statue on its feet and destroyed the glorious statue. And we remember Daniel revealed that that statue represented the kingdoms of this world, beginning with Babylon, as the great golden head. But he also revealed that there would be a kingdom from outside that would come and destroy this worldly project. That there was namely the kingdom of Christ would come into this world and destroy the tower of the kingdoms of this world. So you would be right to be shocked when you see the next verse. When you read chapter 3, verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. This is really the first point. We'll look at, at this idea of another statue. Another statue. We just looked at a statue. A statue in a dream. They got destroyed. And now what do we have in verse 1? Nebuchadnezzar building a giant statue. Okay? Instead of taking the warning of his dream and seeking forgiveness and peace with God, with the God of heaven, it seems that Nebuchadnezzar's doubling down on his kingdom of gold. Isn't he? It's, and we, we read this and we're thinking, come on, Neb. Seriously? Didn't you understand the dream? That this kingdom that God who sets up kings is going to fade? And that you're just part of it? And that one day it's going to be destroyed? Instead, Nebuchadnezzar is doubling down. He's pursuing the building of his golden kingdom. And if you think about it, he's really shaking his fist at the God of heaven, isn't he? He's defiantly building that which God said he would destroy. He's building a, an image of what God said he would destroy. And you can see he's modified even the dream. How has he modified it? It's all gold now. It's all gold. Nebuchadnezzar says, hey, if I'm the golden child, if I'm the golden king, this statue is going to be all gold. And what is that really saying? It's saying there's not going to be an after this. You remember that? Gold, after the gold kingdom, there will be, as it's after this, the silver. And we talked about who that was, right? With Persia. And then after that, and after that, what is Nebuchadnezzar saying by the solid gold? There will be no after this. My kingdom will last forever. He wants to be the whole thing. He is defying the God of heaven. Think about this as well. Daniel had said, in his prayer, that God is the God who sets up kings, right? God is the God who sets up kings. Well, instead of submitting to the God who sets up kings, the king is setting up a God. The king is setting up a God. The dream hasn't had its intended effect, has it? Now this is, just to bring it to our day and age, this is how we might feel when we see rulers of our world failing to learn from the wealth of dystopian literature, right? We have many dreams out there in the form of books and movies that picture this horrible future of this dystopia. And we feel like sometimes our leaders, they think that 1984 is an instruction manual, right? We say, didn't you understand? That was a dystopia. You're not supposed to try to recreate it, right? Or we think that we want to say, no, Mr. Harari, we don't want a brave new world. Didn't you read the book? It's a terrible, it's a dystopia. Well, that's Nebuchadnezzar. He is pressing on. He has not taken the warning. He's arrogant, he's proud, and frankly, he's a megalomaniac. His project is simultaneously idolatrous, 
very religious and idolatrous, and man-centered. It's idolatrous and it's man-centered. We don't know this, if the statue, what exactly the statue looked like, but I can imagine it looked a little bit like Nebuchadnezzar. It most likely did. He was told, you're the statue of gold. You're the golden head. You think that statue had a little bit of Nebuchadnezzar's resemblance? I think it would have. But notice, even if you can't grant that, this statue is always referred to as the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. The image that I have set up. The image that King Nebuchadnezzar set up. Nebuchadnezzar sets up the God to worship. So everyone around who comes to worship this knows whose power and whose project is behind even this idol. It's self-promotion and idolatrous. Notice also how this statue is meant to be a unifying symbol, a gathering point, a place of common ground for the people. It says in verse 2, Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. He gathers people from all over his realm. Every branch of government, every level of bureaucracy, every province. He says, you all need to come here. You all need to gather here. He's bringing them together. And then the herald, he proclaims aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. The cacophony of this diverse music is intended to produce one result, unified worship of the state, or unified worship of the state's God. Worship the idol, all of you. Bow to what, God, what man has made. In this, it's not hard to see, this is really a second attempt at Babel, isn't it? I mean, we are in Babylon, right? And he sets up this statue on the plains of Dura. It's a, the, where was the step Tower of Babel? On the plains of Shinar. Uh, many people think it's probably in the same spot. Probably a similar spot, just two names. The first Babel was built on these very plains, the Tower of Babel. And here he is building this giant 100-foot statue. And the motivations for building that tower were remarkably similar to Nebuchadnezzar's. To make a name for themselves. To make a name, to gather mankind together in one unified purpose. They didn't want to be scattered. They didn't want to be dependent on God anymore. They wanted to gather together. And they wanted to be sufficient in themselves. You know, these unifying projects, wherever we see them, they often have a dark side, don't they? You know, the impulse to bring everyone together, all on one level, it usually ends badly for many people, doesn't it? It's that pressure to conform, and it brings with it the crushing of true diversity. We can see this in Nebuchadnezzar's threat. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. In a totalitarian system, you cannot have outliers. You cannot have a fringe minority. You can't have people who aren't going along with it. You Think about it. You can't be out of step at a North Korean missile parade, right? You can't be. You can't be the Soviet shopkeeper without the Workers of the World Unite poster in your window. You can't build a Christian church in Saudi Arabia. You can't even say certain basic facts of biology on Twitter. Now, you can't take a different view. You can't have this true freedom in these totalitarian systems. And why is that? It's because idolatry always has thin skin. Idolatry always has thin skin. The truth is a threat to idols. The truth is a threat to systems that are built on lies. And have you noticed how often it is the Christian faith, especially a bold proclamation of God's word, that has the biggest target on their back from the world? It's always the Christians. 
Just think of how many religions were tolerated in early Rome, the early Roman Empire. They would tolerate the Jews, they would tolerate all the worship of pagan deities, but they could not tolerate the people of the way. They could not tolerate the Christians who would not honor Caesar as Lord, but instead would say Jesus is Lord. They couldn't accept that level of diversity. Now you would think that our culture would welcome diversity, right? I mean, they, we talk about it enough, don't we? But no, we really don't welcome diversity. Modern day pushers of diversity and multiculturalism, they want a diversity that is skin deep. They want everyone to have different skin and different vices, but to vote the same. They to have a variety of appearance and a variety of pronouns, but absolute unity on cultural, political, and moral issues. Everyone, they want everyone to be just another brick in the wall. However, multicolored and fabulous bricks, right? But it's still another brick in the same project. Now we're encountering this in our day and age, this totalitarian impulse. This is why this story resonates with us a little bit more because we are seeing that pressure to conform, to bring everyone together, to pull in all the same direction. You must think the same. You must stand at attention. You must celebrate. You must post the picture. You must fly the flag. This takes many forms. This is what was so shocking for many of us these last couple of years with the government uh, and our culture's treatment of COVID-19, right? There was no tolerance for anything other than the one way. You must all wear the mask. You must all get the vaccine. You must all stay home and stay safe. You must all bow down to the science. Right? That was the message. It was totalitarian. It was a mono message. It was statism. But we see this in other things as well. Black Lives Matter, you must affirm that narrative in all of its details. If you say anything against it, you are a racist. Abortion, you must affirm the pro-choice narrative or you are anti-women. The Me Too movement, you must believe all women or you are a hateful misogynist. And really the LGBTQ plus Pride Month is really the most fitting example of this totalitolerance, as Doug Wilson would call it, this unifying uh, totalitarianism. When you hear the sounds of the instruments and see the flags in the streets, you must join in. You must celebrate or else. And you see how this story has become more relevant in recent years. Like these three men, we also face the pressure to bow down and to honor what we must not honor, to compromise our faith. But like Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, we must not compromise our faith. We must have the faith to stand. Okay, so this is our second point. The faith to stand. You must have the faith to stand. We find out from our co-workers that these three have so far stood their ground and have passed the test. Verse 12. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Have you seen the image of that defiant odd man out at the Hitler speech? It's a famous photo. Everyone is saluting the dictator, except for this one man, arms crossed in the middle of the crowd, with his face looking not too pleased, defiant. That is Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They are the three standing there in an absolute sea of compliance. And here they are. They're not going along. With everyone around them falling down in worship, these men are standing. They're not, they would not genuflect. They would not bow. They're, they're just standing there. And this leads Nebuchadnezzar to fly off the handle. You know, Luther, he said about the devil, who's that great arch tyrant, he said that there's one thing that the devil cannot handle, and that is he cannot bear scorn. He cannot bear scorn. Well, Nebuchadnezzar is like that as well. He cannot be mocked or ignored. That's how tyrants always are. You cannot mock them or ignore them. They cannot endure it. 
So the king brings them in and gives them one last chance to bow before the image. And this sets us up for perhaps the greatest passage in the whole book of Daniel. Verse 16 through 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. You have to love that response. They are ready to stand. They are ready to stand. They don't need to think it over. They don't need even to start a Bible study or to have a prayer meeting. They know already. They've had the prayer meeting. They've already had the Bible studies. They know what they believe about idolatry. They know that this moment doesn't need a whole rethinking of all of their theology and philosophy of, of the government and their religion and all this. They just need courage to stand. The time has come for orders to obey, either obey God or obey man. And the decision's easy for these faithful men. They do not vacillate and make excuses for compromise. Well, we could just bow a little. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar does like us. Maybe he'll think that's okay. You know, just give a, a little curtsy to the statue and we're all good. Or, you know, guys, we aren't being seen as very winsome right now. You know, like we're being treated like disobedient rebels and it'll be written later in the New Testament that we don't want to, you know, be thought of as a, as a rebel or to suffer as an evildoer. Well, that's what they're saying. We're evildoers. We're ruining our witness. What a bad witness. We don't want to have a bad testimony. No, they don't do any of that. They're firm. We will not. We will not. Sorry, Neb. Can't do it. We can't do it, King. But they tell Nebuchadnezzar much more than a firm no. They demonstrate their faith in the God of heaven. They had a faith that confessed God's sovereignty and power. They say, if this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able, is able to deliver us. Do you see that? He's able. We believe in the Lord. He's here. He's with us. He's able. So we don't need to obey you. We're not going to obey you against our, own, against our God. They had a faith that confessed God's sovereignty and power. Uh, as James Boyce points out in his commentary, these three things. They knew that God was sovereign. They knew the scriptures. And they were willing to die for their convictions. Okay? They knew that their God was sovereign and control had all power. They knew the scriptures. They knew what they believed. And they had the courage, the conviction to die for their convictions. He, you know, he notes as well in the commentary that you can have the first two, but lack the third. Think about it. You can know that God is sovereign. You can even know the scriptures and what you ought to do. And then you can lack the courage to do it. You can lack the courage to do it. What sets these orthodox believers apart is not their doctrine, but their courage. As C.S. Lewis said, Courage is not simply one of the virtues, but the form of every virtue at the testing point. Okay? So, do you love God? That is proved by courage or a lack of courage. Do you have faith? That is proved by courage or a lack of courage. What good is all the right belief in the world if you lack courage? What good is all of the confessions in the world if you don't believe them when it counts, if you don't have faith? This is the question we need to ask ourselves. What kind of faith do you have? What kind of faith do you have? What kind of faith do I have? Do you have faith to trust Jesus in the good times and for, and for good times? You know, that's easy, right? Trusting that Jesus will save you, help you, and even give you a wonderful life. This is what so many apparent Christians are believing in. They like a God 
who can give them their best life now, a God who makes them feel like they're special, that they can do this, that they are enough. But that's not saving faith in a God like that. That's not a faith that can stand. Tribulations will blow that faith over because they've not believed in the real Jesus. Those who believe that kind of gospel, they've believed in a faraway granddaddy in the sky who tells them sweet nothings and instructs them to be nice and to do good. That's not our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is, his salvation is not just to make you happy and healthy and have a wonderful life. That is not our God. The real Jesus is the Lord. He's the Lord. He's high and lifted up. He is exalted at the right hand of the Father. And He bids you, when you believe in Him, it's not that you won't have a wonderful life. Yes, you will. You'll have eternal life. But He bids you come and die. He says, all the things that you've been living for, you need to crucify them. Those need to die. If you want to come with me, you need to know who you're coming with. You're coming with a Savior who bore a cross. And if you want to follow Him, you need to go with, the, with Him on that cross with your sins. Your sins need to be pierced. Your sins need to be buried. That's the only way that you can become new. That's the call of the gospel. It's not a work that you do, but it is. If you want to be saved, you need you to die. You need Him to take your sins into the grave. That's the, that is the real gospel. He says, take up your cross and follow me. He says, lay down your life to surrender all, to repent and believe the gospel. To repent means to drop the worldly lusts. And how many times do we hear Christians in our world, or quote Christians, who are believing in God for the fulfillment of their worldly lusts? That's not the gospel. The gospel is to lay down you and to receive him for all of you. So again, what kind of life, what kind of faith do you have? What kind of faith do you have? Maybe your faith is correct, but is it a bare intellectual faith? That's no good either. Faith is a word of action. Faith is tested in moments like this here in our passage. Faith needs to be tested. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah had faith, not just for the good times. They had a faith that was strong enough to stand when their lives were on the line. They could stand in the worst of storms. Their faith was not merely theoretical or intellectual. It was a living faith in their living God. They exemplify that great line from the Heidelberg Catechism that we sang tonight, today. What is your only comfort in life and death? That I am not my own, but belong with body and soul, both in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Do you hear the call of the gospel? It is that you would belong to God. That you'd say, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Like Paul says, I don't count my life of any value or as precious to myself. I only want to serve King Jesus. I belong to him. You know, that's what real faith is. That's what repentance and faith is. It's a whole commitment to the Lord. Holding nothing back and saying, here I am, Lord. Apparently you're saving sinners. Here's a sinner. Do with me what you will. If you try to hold back anything, you don't have real faith. That is not real faith that holds back a portion of your life for you to remain Lord over. And this is the faith of of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They stand there, and they're about to lose everything that they thought they could still hold on to, and they say, no, I already gave that up. I've already given up my life. I already belong to the Lord. So what can Nebuchadnezzar do to me? He can just kill me. Big deal. I've already died. I've already died. I live in my Lord. I live in my Lord. Can you say that? Will you say that when the world comes crashing down on you? Will you say that when the music is played and the pressure is on and your job is on the line, your friendships are on the line, your family is on the line, your life is on the line? Will you stand with Jesus then? Will your faith hold then? 
Will you stand or will you bow? You know, Martin Luther is a great example of this kind of courageous faith. Martin Luther, that famous reformer, he'd recovered the biblical gospel, was preaching it, the Reformation was spreading throughout Germany and into Europe, but it was greatly opposed by the Roman Catholics. And he was at one point pinned down at the Diet of Worms and asked by the various authorities to recant. Take back what you said in your books, Martin. Take it back or else we're going to punish you. It's over for you. Just recant. But Luther is recorded as saying these famous words. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything. For to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand. I can do no other. Oh, how the church in the 21st century, or the 22nd, here's how the, the church in the 21st century, I got confused there for a minute. Um, here's, oh, how the church here needs Martin Luther's today. We need Luther's today. Men and women who will not live for man's approval, but live for God's approval, who when they're pinned down by all the authorities, have the courage to say, here I stand, I can do no other. We need to stand with the three friends and say to all the enemies of God, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us and he will deliver us. But even if he doesn't deliver us, be it known that we will not serve your gods. We will not worship any idol ever. Do you have a faith like that? Do you have a faith of backbone? Well, you heard the story. Nebuchadnezzar doesn't take this well, right? He orders the furnace cranked up he has the three men thrown into it, but all doesn't go according to plan. There's a hiccup in Nebuchadnezzar's plan. There's a stone in the gears, as it were, an unexpected twist. This leads us to our third point and final point, the savior in the furnace. The three men are miraculously saved from the fire. We know that part of the story. They're saved so thoroughly that not even a hint of campfire smoke that pungent aroma that we know so well, not even a hint of it was on them. There is indeed a miracle there in the fact that you see, they're unbound. They went in there, they got thrown in there like a sack of luggage, and here they are, unbound, walking, and they come out, untinged by campfire. But there's something else in the text that gets my attention, and indeed it got Nebuchadnezzar's attention. The fourth person in the fire. Verse 24. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, But I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Many have suggested that this fourth person is more than just an angel from the Lord. That this is an appearance of Christ, a Christophany, a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord himself. He's not just like a son of the gods, but he is the son of God. And I'm inclined to think this is the case, as many others are as well. But even regardless, whether it was an angel or the sun, this is a display of God being with his people, isn't it? Truly, this is Emmanuel, God with us. The Lord promised his people this very thing hundreds of years before through the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 43, 1-2 says this, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by, my, by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. You know, we thought that was poetic, right? The flames of trials and tribulations. Well, they got to see it in a physical way as well. To literally live in the fire with the presence of the Lord. Now notice that too. The Lord did not promise to take us around the waters or around the fire. But what did the Lord promise? To be 
with you, to be with you. Every Christian who endures trials by faith will testify that that promise is true. That the great Savior, Jesus Christ, never leaves his people, not for one moment. The Lord said to Joshua, on the eve of battle, be strong and courageous. I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. And if you had any doubt if that would apply to you as, a, as not a Joshua, but just an ordinary person of the Lord, the writer to the Hebrews applies that to all Christians, writing, For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Hebrews 13, 5. And Jesus closed out the Great Commission with this very promise. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The Savior is in the furnace. The Savior is in the valley. He's with his people always. There was a great missionary named John Patton, who in 1858 went to the New Hebrides. It's a place now known as Vanuatu, in the Pacific Islands of Southeast Asia. Well, he was ministering among the tribes of cannibals as a pioneer missionary to give these lost people the gospel. And really, his story is absolutely amazing. I'd encourage you to read his story if you can. He endures trials over decades, and eventually the entire nation is converted to Christ. It's an incredible story. But John Patton knew what it was to suffer for the Lord, to endure hardship and trials, to be in the furnace of affliction. He lost his wife, his first child, to, to fever, and he was all alone, and he continued to serve the Lord there. He knew about that. But he testified to this very truth, that the Lord never leaves his people, that he is always there. Listen to his description of a night that he spent hiding in a tall tree while the islanders ran around like crazy looking for him to kill him. Okay, he's hiding in this tall tree. I'll read from the book. I climbed into the tree and was left there alone in the bush, the hours I spent there live all before me as if it were but of yesterday. I heard the frequent discharging of muskets and the yells of the savages, yet I sat there among the branches as safe as in the arms of Jesus. Never in all my sorrows did my Lord draw nearer to me and speak more soothingly in my soul than when the moonlight flickered among those chestnut leaves and the night air played on my throbbing brow as I told all my heart to Jesus, alone, yet not alone. If it be to glorify my God, I will not grudge to spend many nights alone in such a tree, to feel again my Savior's spiritual presence, to enjoy his consoling fellowship. If thus thrown back upon your own soul, alone, all alone, in the midnight, in the bush, in the very embrace of death itself, have you a friend that will not fail you then? Oh, friends, this is what I'm getting at. Have you a friend like Jesus? Have you been united to him by faith so that come what may, you will never be alone? You will never be alone. And don't get the wrong idea. It's not about how strong your faith is. It's about how strong your Savior is whom you are connected to, the one who is with you. He's the one who saved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were not saved because their faith was so strong. They were saved by faith. It was real faith. It was real faith. But it was the grace of the Lord that saved them. And so it is with you and me. We will be saved from the fires of judgment by the one who took those fires for us, the one who walked through them. Surely he's with us always, and the flames shall not hurt you. I love the old hymn that we sang, the first song today, How Firm a Foundation. And I remember singing this at a senior's home with others from my church at the time. And I'll never forget, there was one dear sister named Jody who could never sing that song without tears. And she was supposed to be helping me sing it too. And she fell apart every time. Maybe we sang it too fast. Maybe you didn't hear these words the way you should have today. But listen to these words. Verses, I'll do verses 2 to 4. Fear not, I am with thee. Oh, be not dismayed, 
For I am thy God and will still give thee aid. I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand, upheld by my righteous, omnipotent hand. When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all-sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee. I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. The soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose, I will not, I will not desert to his foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no never, no never forsake. This is the good news that each of us have come to inherit as Christians. We have a Savior who will never leave you, never forsake you. Whatever you'll ever go through, any pressure from the world that leads you into a dark valley, any suffering that you go through, you will not be alone. And you'll not be alone precisely because the Lord Jesus was alone for you. you will, the flames will not hurt you because the flames of God's wrath hurt him, were spent on him. Do you understand that? It is by the grace of the Lord Jesus that you're saved. He's the fourth man. He's the one who goes into the furnace and saves us. He's the deliverer. You know, Nebuchadnezzar asked the question, who is the God who can deliver you out of my hand? Well, Nebuchadnezzar got an answer, didn't he? The God of Israel, the Lord God, Yahweh, the Lord Jesus Christ, the great God and Savior, he can save, and he does save. So take comfort, Christian. Stand with Christ. Fight any battle that is before you, any foe. Fight every battle of this world, the flesh, and the devil, the things that are against God, that are thrown at you. Be strong and courageous and know that he will never leave you. You will never be truly alone. Your God will never, no, never, no, never forsake you. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for this, this text of scripture. We know there's so much there. And we just thank you, Lord, for your grace that gives us the strength, Lord, to stand, that you've given us a faith, Lord, that we know the truth, that we can stand firm for you. Lord, give us all that courage. Help us to be like Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Help us to be faithful even unto death. Lord, we thank you more than everything, Lord. We thank you that you are with us, that you'd never leave us. And Lord, we, we in fact welcome trials and tribulations, knowing that you design them for our good, that you will carry us through them, that as dark as it gets, the light of your presence will never go out. And for that, we thank you, we thank you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.